Welcome back everyone, it's Guy and Matt here and now in 2024 we want to start with a video on Lidu and this is because the last video about Lidu that we published back in 2023 actually got some attention and I think it was pretty much enjoyed by the community and so today we want to do the same and we're gonna release a video about Lidu giving a lecture at the Enoch Wealth Institute in 2021 but similarly to what we did for last video in 2023 we are gonna use OpenAI to maybe making it a little bit more digestible. As we did last time for the other video, we used the API of OpenAI to translate the original video of Li Lu speaking Chinese. And then after translating it, we used ChatGPT to proofread the translation in English. This is not exactly a word by word translation of the video. It's also a proofread version. So it's a little bit shorter, but hopefully it is in form that is more digestible and more natural in American English. I hope you will enjoy it and please like the video and subscribe to the channel. Thank you. Globalization isn't just a possibility. It's a reality that has emerged uniquely in the past 30 years. Historically, markets were often formed through political unification, be it within a single country, alliances between nations, or military pacts. The essence of a free market, which inherently creates winners and losers, benefits society in the long run. However, it also brings significant short-term societal pressures, necessitating political adjustments. This includes various forms of social welfare, unemployment insurance, re-education opportunities, and government redistribution in countries worldwide. Unfortunately, our global political system lacks mechanisms for such secondary adjustments. While international organizations like the UN, World Bank, and World Economic Forum exist, they can't replicate the role of a national government. Hence, globalization, though challenged, has contributed enough to mitigate its own negative impacts. Major economies, especially the leading nations, must proactively make adjustments through political and economic policies. Rational leadership among these major countries is crucial. The past four years have shown the consequences of irrational leadership, notably under Trump, whose actions often undermined American interests. In contrast, the Biden era and current Chinese leadership give hope for the G20, representing the world's major economies to adopt a more rational approach. International conflicts and contradictions might be resolved through political cooperation between countries. Can a single nation alter the course of the global economy away from globalization? It seems unlikely. The United States initially established the current international economic order, exercising control over market access. But as any company founder knows, once a company grows, it evolves beyond the founder's control. Similarly, globalization now encompasses all 7 billion people worldwide, with every economic entity intricately linked within the system, making all countries stakeholders. While the U.S. retains significant influence, it's no longer the sole decision-maker, and its proportional influence has diminished. After World War II, the U.S. economy constituted over 50% of the global economy. Now it's around 20%, with China's economy, by purchasing power parity, surpassing the U.S. Soon, the two economies will be on par. This economic evolution suggests that the largest market will eventually become the only market. In this global market, economies that are most efficient and technologically advanced will prevail, while others will lose competitiveness. Thus, a return to the past, or a descent into a cold or hot war, would be a self-destructive choice, akin to mutual annihilation. The present international economic structure is unlikely to change significantly soon, as major economies, including China and the US, acknowledge this reality and are moving towards rationality. While different standards and competition will persist, the global economy will remain a singular market where all technologies compete. This scenario might seem chaotic, but the overall trajectory remains clear. The likelihood of irrational leadership disrupting the current scenario is low. In major economies worldwide, including China and the United States, we're witnessing a resurgence of rationality. This change affects not only the economy, but also technological development, as both continue to operate within a singular global market. Governments, however, will still play a crucial role in making secondary adjustments on a political level, and this includes the realm of technology. 
We may witness the emergence of varying standards, but even these will have to compete within this unified market. Consequently, businesses might not rely on a single supplier, but several, including local ones from China, which, despite not being the most efficient or advanced, will become part of this new landscape. This shift won't alter the fundamental reality. The world economy remains a single, interconnected market where all technologies ultimately compete. The situation may appear chaotic, but the underlying clarity and direction remain unchanged. Addressing the future's complexities, where economy and politics intertwine, requires rational leadership. During the pandemic, I found insights in literature, particularly from a Soviet author, Boris Pasternak, and his work, Dr. Zhivago. This novel illustrates individual struggles amidst great societal changes, reflecting our current epoch's complexities and uncertainties. These themes resonate with what I discussed in my book on civilization and value investing. In such an uncertain future, we must consider the choices and preparations necessary for navigating these complexities. I appreciate Bolt's adaptation of Dr. Zhivago. Life, with its inevitable highs and lows, often seems without pattern in the short term. However, looking back, the peaks and valleys of our personal journeys often appear less dramatic. From the perspective of a Chinese entrepreneur, China stands as one of the most fortunate nations in recent centuries. The country has already taken significant steps towards modernization, especially after 40 years of reform and opening up. Despite the existing gap with developed nations, China's national drive remains strong and its future development looks promising. Setting aside personal challenges and grievances, the current generation of Chinese people is perhaps the most fortunate in the last two centuries. Though we may have experienced more fortunate times in the past, such periods are historical anomalies rather than the norm. Life's fluctuations are natural, and embracing both the good and the bad without dwelling in complaint is a healthier approach. Personally, I prefer to see the glass as half full rather than half empty and focus on the positives in my life. Reflecting on the past, we are witnessing a transition from a third world existence to a first world standard within a single generation. This is a remarkable achievement, not just for the hundreds of millions of people in China who have experienced it, but also in the context of human history. No other nation has ascended from third world status to first world prominence so rapidly and with such a vast population. This progress is truly exhilarating, and we must remember that many more are still undergoing this transformation. Today, China boasts a middle class of 400 million people. This number could potentially double or even more in the future, presenting tremendous opportunities ahead. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Lee. It's clear that you maintain both caution and optimism in your outlook. Recently, I've been contemplating our place in the universe. While it's challenging to predict the ultimate fate of our planet, we as humans are subject to the same relentless laws that govern the universe's life cycle. In the midst of these vast concepts, the complexities of national policies, technological advancements, and various forms seem overwhelming. However, in our present moment, each of us has the power to make individual decisions and choices. We're fortunate to have many esteemed clients with us, and we recently held a seminar on philosophy and psychology. The focus was on helping everyone better understand their role in this complex world and how to live fully in the present. We have time for a few spontaneous questions. If you have any, please feel free to ask Mr. Lee. The more thought-provoking your questions are, the richer his insights will be. Shifting back to the realm of financial investment, Mr. Lee, you've been investing in your own ventures since graduating from the University of Gansu over 20 years ago. You faced numerous challenges, but have consistently adhered to your belief in value investing. In our finance courses, I often ask my students to choose their investment philosophy, value investing, or a focus on technology. Mr. Lee, after navigating through many hardships, you've become a testament to the power of personal conviction in investment strategy. Your success is evident, considering that world-renowned investors like Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger have chosen you to manage their assets. It's rare to find someone more qualified than you in this field, which is a significant accomplishment. Investing fundamentally involves predicting the future. 
And as you mentioned, establishing a margin of safety for your investments is crucial. When evaluating a company's value, what do you consider the most critical factor? And under what circumstances do you reassess your initial valuation? Do you have a specific method or model that guides you in this process? Lilu, first, thank you for the kind words. Though I must say, I feel luck has played a significant role in my journey. In my life, and in the lives of many successful people I know, luck has been a crucial factor. My own path in investing began somewhat fortuitously. When I first arrived in the United States, I happened to hear a speech by Warren Buffett, who was then unknown to me. That speech profoundly influenced me, and within a year, I was employing Buffett's methods in my first stock purchase. It's been 28 years since, and I've remained committed to this approach. Buffett often likened value investing to a vaccine. It either takes hold or it doesn't. He observed that those who don't initially embrace value investing rarely convert later on. This resonates with my own experience. I've never seriously considered any other investment strategy. Others may be drawn to different methods, but I have always found value investing to be the most compelling approach. Many argue that value investing aligns with certain character traits. Whether this is innate or developed early in life, I'm not sure. But it seems that successful value investors share a common disposition. They rely on logic and facts, unconcerned with market sentiment, and are patient in their pursuit of wealth, undeterred by short-term gains or losses. The journey of a value investor is often slow and steady, requiring a deep understanding of what truly makes a company valuable. To me, the value of a company lies in its potential to generate cash over its lifetime. Predicting this is challenging because the future is uncertain and companies face constant changes in demand, competition, and market conditions. The crux of value investing is to understand a business's competitive landscape. A profitable company will invariably attract competition, so the key is identifying those that can sustain their competitive edge over time. Most companies lack a lasting competitive advantage. They may be profitable for a while, then fade away. A rare few, however, manage to maintain high returns on capital over extended periods. The reasons for this can vary. Monopoly conditions, technological leadership, exceptional management, unique organizational culture, innovative business models, or specific consumer appeal. Understanding these factors and their sustainability is what makes investing so intriguing and endlessly educational. In investing, unlike other fields, your knowledge doesn't become obsolete, but accumulates, much like wealth. Einstein famously referred to compound interest as the eighth wonder of the world, and this principle holds true in investing as well. Take Berkshire Hathaway, for example. Since Buffett took control in 1965, its stock price has skyrocketed from around 10 to between $300,000 and $400,000 achieving an average annual return of 18 to 19% over more than five decades. Such long-term, thoughtful investment in businesses leads to a profound accumulation of knowledge, paralleling the growth in wealth. As your experience and understanding deepen, your ability to judge businesses and predict their futures improves dramatically. This is the real essence of investing. It's an ongoing educational journey that continually enhances your analytical skills. In contrast, those who focus solely on market trends and trading styles are often left vulnerable to shifts in market dynamics. The story of Jesse Livermore, a famous trader from the 1920s depicted in the book Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, is a cautionary tale. Despite his initial success, he faced multiple bankruptcies and personal tragedies. This contrast highlights the enduring value of genuine, long-term investing over speculative trading. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Lee. It's evident that you are a person of great strength and character. Your passion for investment is palpable, and it has clearly shaped your expertise within this industry. Your ability to discern the nuances of a company's competitive dynamics and potential drawbacks is impressive. Indeed, time is not only an ally of entrepreneurs, but also of investors. Your insights into the true essence of value investing are enlightening. I'm aware that you're also a devoted father to three daughters. Balancing family life with four women must be quite an experience. You've mentioned that a father's role is to be a guiding example. 
How do you navigate family relationships and serve as a role model for your children? Li Lu, at the heart of it all is maintaining a balanced perspective. The most crucial aspect is to have a grounded, humble outlook. It's important not to overestimate your own significance, whether in success or failure. Although hard work is essential, much of life's outcomes are influenced by being in the right place at the right time. Essentially, it boils down to luck. While we often like to emphasize our role in our successes, a more objective view would recognize the significant role luck plays. This grounded approach brings a lot of enjoyment to life. Our lives should be driven by passion, not fear. Youth often brings insecurities about various aspects of life, leading to feelings of inadequacy. However, it's important to realize that this sense of insecurity is only a temporary motivator. The true, enduring driving force in life is love. Love for oneself, life, family, work, and the simple joys around us. By adopting this mindset, one can find immense pleasure in everyday experiences, even those that seem mundane. I try to see the world through the eyes of the young and the innocent to keep my perspective fresh and full of wonder. This approach to life makes every day interesting and fulfilling. Consider my mentor, Charlie Munger. Approaching 97, he remains deeply curious about the world. Today, we spent nearly 40 minutes discussing the new Pfizer vaccine and its impressive efficacy. Charlie's age hasn't diminished his enthusiasm for learning and understanding the world. This kind of open-heartedness filled with curiosity and love, enables us to navigate any challenge. Opposition isn't something to dread, it's often endearing. By shedding negative emotions and focusing on our passions, life becomes a joyful journey. Whether it's in business, philanthropy, or learning, doing the right thing in the right way brings immense satisfaction. Ultimately, despite the inevitability of life's end, it's the happiness we find along the way that matters most. This journey, filled with love and curiosity, makes life not just bearable, but truly remarkable. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Your passion for investment and your quest for truth in life are truly inspiring to us all. I've noticed that your throat seems a bit uncomfortable. Please do take care of your health and thank you for persevering today. Now a question from one of our clients related to investment. As an investor deeply engaged with China's economic growth, how do you recommend we protect and grow our wealth? There's considerable interest in investing in your fund, but I understand that from the beginning, even when funds were limited, you were selective about your investors, seeking those who share your philosophy and commitment for the long term. Could you elaborate on how we can safeguard and enhance our wealth, and also how can we use the power of wealth to contribute to greater beauty and prosperity in the world? Li Lu. Our investment philosophy is fundamentally about sharing. I've always believed that making money should not come at the expense of others. For instance, I've traditionally shunned management fees. We haven't charged them from the outset. About 60% of our fund is managed for free, and later on, profits are shared. This principle extends to my personal investment strategy as well. I exclusively invest in my own fund. This conviction stems from the belief that enduring success in investment is possible only if there's a collective sharing of both risks and rewards. This approach alleviates pressure and enables me to think and act with a long-term perspective. When advising others, I often reflect on my own strategies. The first step I'd recommend is to invest in a handful of companies you deeply understand. In my case, the most familiar company is my own startup. As an entrepreneur, I constantly evaluate whether reinvesting in my company could yield superior returns compared to the average market. Could we establish and maintain a sustainable competitive edge? Believing in my company's strong competitive position, I chose to invest almost all my resources in it. For entrepreneurs, who typically expend most of their energy managing their businesses, finding the right investment manager becomes crucial. This manager should treat your funds with as much care as their own. To determine the suitability of a manager, consider several factors. Are they practicing sound investment principles? Do they have unique advantages or insights in their methodology and have these translated into long-term performance success? Also crucial is the alignment of interests. Be wary of managers who prioritize their own gains, 
such as through management fees, regardless of their fund's performance. Such a conflict of interests can dilute the value they offer. Finding a trustworthy manager with aligned interests and expertise in a less competitive investment field is key. This person should be able to maintain an edge in their chosen domain. Additionally, consider their age to ensure a long-term investment horizon. If finding such a manager proves challenging, an index fund is a sound alternative. In China, the index fund landscape is still maturing and may not fully capture the economy's dynamics. However, with the ongoing market reforms, we can expect Chinese indexes to become more representative. These funds then become a strategic choice, encompassing a broad spectrum of the economy, including companies listed in China and abroad. In essence, the most detrimental investment approach is one marked by chaos and lack of strategy. Belief in luck without an understanding of probability can lead to financial peril. At the bare minimum, holding cash, although not ideal, is preferable to reckless investment. The most judicious approach is well-considered strategic investment, guided by sound principles and a clear understanding of the market dynamics. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Lee, for your profound insights. Your advice clearly delineates the various levels of investment strategy. From the chaotic, undisciplined approaches at the lower end, through the safety of cash holdings, and up to the more structured realm of index investments. Further, you've highlighted the importance of carefully selecting an investor manager or becoming an entrepreneur investor yourself, guided by five key principles. Throughout your discussion, one theme resonated deeply with me, a theme that Jingbo and I touched upon at the start, the enduring power of love. This is something I sense strongly in your approach, Mr. Lee. Your joy and appreciation for the entire journey of life and investment is palpable, and I believe everyone here can feel it. Although it's with regret that we must conclude, we eagerly anticipate further interactions with you in Shanghai. Thank you once again for sharing your wisdom and experiences with us.